Do you have something for us? Well, my name is Jeremy King. I am the director of uh, sustainability and campus improvement for Denison. I've been in that position since 2009. Um, I am a born and raised Bramble resident. I graduated from the class of 93 from Bramble High School. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I served in Ecuador doing sustainable development from 2007 to 2009. When I got back, Denison had this job open. Um, and honestly, I looked at the job description. I'm like, somebody like got in my head and said, what would the perfect job be? And they created it for me. Uh, because I love renewable energy. I love local foods. I love recycling. I love you know, being outside in the environment. Um, and my job at Denison incorporates all of those things. Um, early on in my career at Denison, as, a, as an employee of the college, I was tasked with sort of figuring out renewable energy for the college. Uh, this picture right here is part of our 10 acre solar array that we have in the southeast corner of the bioreserve with pollinator habitat. And, and I'll touch on this later in the, in the presentation as well. Um, but then over, over time, like in 2012 or so, there was a group of um, Granville residents, 2013 actually, a group of Granville and Lincoln County residents that formed um, the Lincoln County Solar Cooperative. Richard Downs was part of that group, some of you probably know Richard. Um, and, and he and I sort of led that group. And it was really an education and outreach about solar power, um, how, to, how to get solar on your homes, what it means, what the rules are in Ohio. Uh, and I've been doing solar really ever since then. And I will, I'll just say this, if any of you are interested in solar for your homes, just reach out to me. I am, I am happy to do a free solar analysis for you. Um, just going up on your, on your roof, it's, it's gonna be rooftop or if it's in the yard, taking some images, running it through um, a program that I have and it'll spit out sort of what the solar potential is for your, for your home or your business or whatever it is. I'm happy to do that as a service, um, as part of my work with Denison, no cost to you, um, no strings attached. You have this nice report, and or if you um, have had somebody come out or plan to have somebody come out offering you a solar array, and you want someone to review that proposal, so make sure you know you're not getting hoodwinked. I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. I have a lot of slides. Some of them I'm going to probably just skip right over, depending on the questions that you ask. And every slide, if there's something you want to ask, please don't wait to the end. Just throw it out there. Um, but if I'm like, I'm just going to skip over this, the reason being, I get into the nitty gritty on a few things, and that may not be of interest to some of you, um, and I don't want to bog us down on that. So here we go. First things first, it is a, a misnomer and a myth that solar doesn't work in places like Ohio. So what this graph is showing you is, it is solar radiation, um, the, the potential to, to use um, solar for solar PD across the United States, no big secret that when you look in the desert Southwest, there are a lot more sunny days, you know, that's why you see high potential here and you see less potential up here in the, you know, Ohio gray and all of that. This is Germany, by example, Germany is one of the leading countries of the world utilizing solar. So it is really less about the solar potential and more about the economics behind it. We'll get into that. But if you look at the top 10 states with solar, Look at these. This was in that green area. And these are top 10. And what that means, the amount of solar being produced in those states. So no secret here that we see a lot there. But this is, this is somewhat surprising um, when you think about that sort of green uh, layer there where you have less solar radiation. Part of the reason that you see pretty good development in this area is that the price that they pay for electricity is higher than what we pay for electricity here in the Midwest. Anyone know what you pay per kilowatt hour on your bill? Really? <laughs> um, it, it works out to once you remove the taxes and the, the, uh, the fees that you have to pay that are unrelated to your usage, um, it works out to be 12 or 13 cents per kilowatt hour. That's an important number to remember because if you invest in solar for your home, that is part of what goes into the calculation of is this a sound financial investment? So the viability of solar is, again, getting to the economics here, it's less about how much radiation you have and more about the price you pay. So here's three scenarios. The size of the system is the same. So this would be just like a residential array. In California, that's their price of electricity, all right? This system is going to produce that much power. 
16,000 kilowatt hours. The average home uses about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year for reference. Um, so it's going to offset that much in utility costs annually. So it tells you that you're going to have this six year payoff. Um, you're going to have a 6% over 25 year rate of return. This is where we're kind of getting the nitty gritty. Here in Granville, okay, here's our cost. And you can see that the rate of return is about 3%. It's going to take 12 years, twice as long. Partly because in California, you produce more energy than you do here in Granville, but the price of electricity in California is more. So you're saving more on your utility bill, which is why you get that faster payback. And this is the interesting one. You go to Oklahoma, Oklahoma actually gets more solar radiation than we do in Ohio. So this array is going to produce more power than Granville, yet the rate of return is less, the payback period is less. Because the price that they pay for their electricity is less. So again, I can't stress enough when you think about solar, is this right for me? Is it worth it? It really is. How much energy is it going to produce? And what is it offsetting on your utility bill? So just keep that in mind as we go through this. So second myth, cost too much to be viable. Essentially what we just what we just covered. That's not me, although I'd, I'd like to have muscles like that. <laughs> Um, here's what's gone on with the price of solar um, over time since 2010. You can see, doesn't matter where you are, US, China, India, globally, the price of solar has dropped significantly. Are there different kinds of, there's two USAs listed for different things? Yep. Let um, so I get this to go back. Um, so these are just two different entities calculating that. So Lazar, I don't know if it's Lazar or Lazar, it's one of the um, entities that really has done a deep dive into solar analysis. Um, and the LDNL is probably um, a government entity. And so just two different people looking at the data sets. And then this is the price of, um, this is for silicon-based solar, PV per watt. And you can see again, since President Carter installed it on the White House, so roughly now, how much that has dropped. I mean, it's incredible how much it's dropped. <laughs> cost that of, in dollars or was that, that is those dollars versus today's dollars? No, no, that's, that's, true, that's those dollars versus today's. Okay. Yep, so yeah, it would be um, a bigger drop. It would. Yep. It would certainly be. So cost of solar panels over time. So this is cost installed. This is for residential. We'll get into the bigger rates later in the presentation, but for residential, this is the cost over time per watt installed. So this would include the labor to install it and the materials, any fees that you have to pay for interconnection um, or zoning, you know, building and zoning permits and things like that. So you can see dramatically this drop here. So I, I installed an array in my house in 2013. And you can see now it's all, we almost have the cost. Yeah. That's, that's just crazy how much that's gone down. Part of it has become the has happened because the labor market's gotten tighter. There are more players in the in the field, not, not tighter, but um, there are more players in the field. And if one area that solar companies can move the needle on what they offer you in terms of price is by sort of messing around with what the labor charge is, what the cost to actually physically put it up. Um, and so you've seen a drop in that in, in a good way, I think, because 10 years ago, solar companies were charging you three or four dollars. Um, a lot to install an array, and now they're charging you a dollar. And we know that the price of labor has gone up in that time frame. So they were just reaping tons and tons of you know money off of that deal, and because they could, because people were really interested in solar and wanted to have solar, and because there were tons of tax incentives going on at the state level and at the federal level, and so there's just money flowing into solar. We can argue whether that's good or bad, and I'm happy to have that argument at any point. Mythbusters number three, no power at night or when the grid goes down. How many of you would honestly say this is a concern? When you think about solar, you're like, I'm just worried about solar only produces during the day. Some, maybe. The way that solar works 99% of the time, including for Denison that has that big solar array, is solar happens during the day and it runs our meter backwards or runs your meter backwards when you're producing more power than you're using. 
Um, at any point in time, clouds go over, you turn your air conditioning unit on or it cycles on, or you've got the hot water heater cycles on, your array may still be producing power, but if it's not producing as much as you're using, you're still drawing a little bit from the grid. And at night, you're drawing all your power from the grid. So the grid is essentially your, your battery, your backup system, and solar's not working. So this really doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference, except for this whole idea of you have a storm, power goes out on the grid, you have this beautiful solar array on your roof, and you can't get power from it. That is true, unless you have a battery system. Some, some type of battery backup system. That's the only way that you'd be able to draw power off of that. So when we had, um, what was the hurricane that passed through the, the um, mid-Atlantic back in 2015 or 16? Mm -hmm. was, what was it? Mm -hmm. Sandy, thank you. Um, when that passed through, you had people that were early adopters of things like Teslas who had solar on their house and they were flipping out because they had no power and they're like, I've got this car, with batteries, I've got this big solar in my house. Like, this is crazy. Why doesn't this work? Why can't I get power? The grid was down for days in some cases, and people were really frustrated. Well, the solar industry, you know, they, they took notice of that, and they, they're starting to develop technology um, within the solar arrays that would give you real time power even when the grid goes down. Meaning, as long as the sun's out. You can produce power. You can't store it, but you can produce power to run like a refrigerator or something like that. Um, and they call that opportunity power. And it's built into the infrastructure of any of the inverters that you have, which is the device that takes power from the solar panels and turns it into AC power. Because solar produces at the DC level direct current, and you turn it into alternating current. The other thing that Hurricane Sandy and other and other events have caused to happen is electric automakers, EV makers, are now designing their cars and planning to design their cars so that you can actually use your car battery to power your car. So you're charging your car during the day at night at your house, power on the grid goes down, that power can be drained from your battery to flow back into your house. That's revolutionary in my mind. Think about a Tesla that's got a 60 kilowatt hour battery. 60 kilowatts in my house would run my house for probably three or four days. Longer if I didn't worry about air conditioning. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So, solar PV isn't a tried and true technology. I hear this all the time when I talk about, like, yeah, you know, I, I'm interested in solar, but it's still new. Well, we already mentioned President Carter putting it on the White House in 1977. Um, you know, these are solar panels here. People kind of forget about that. But we took these up to the moon when we did our Apollo landings. These solar panels that were tied to radio devices that was, and, and, and uh, cameras that were sending information back are still functioning for the 60s and for the 70s. Amazing. I'm not going to show that video, but um, solar PV is not aesthetically pleasing. Actually, I think it's supposed to be myth number five. Oh, we have five now. What this is four. <coughs> yeah. All right. Number five. I, I messed up. This is another concern that a lot of people have, especially here in Granville. How many are all of you from Granville? Proper? Sort of, kind of. Uh, so, and it's not just limited to Granville, but I'll use Granville as an example. There are, there's a lot of solar going on in Granville. There's a lot of people who live within the historic district who want to put solar up in their houses. And Granville still does not have anything in the codified ordinances that specifically sort of says, yes, you can or no, you can't, but this is how it all works. And so solar is often seen as a conditional use, which there's nothing wrong with that. But what that does mean is that if I want to put solar on my house and I'm in a historic district, all of my neighbors can weigh in on whether or not, whether or not they want that solar. And, and I'm not going to say whether that's good or bad. My out of your screen, my gosh, I'm wandering. <laughs> yeah, my screen is I get so excited, I'm on the page. Um, and so what people often say is, you know, I'm not anti-solar, it's ugly. It just doesn't look right. And there are lots of things on lots of people's houses, no offense to anyone in the room, that I might like find displeasing. You know, um, where others are like, this is the most beautiful pink door that I've ever had. You know, um, yeah, I'm sure it's good. right. And I like this. I'm going to steal this from Richard Downs. Those of you that know Richard may have heard him say this, but um, Richard has often said in, in meetings where, where people are going through the zoning process, like, well, if you really think about the founders of they would totally be into solar. 
because this is how you lived. You adapted to what you know the, the changing environment was to be able to survive. And what better thing to be able than to be able to be in control of your own energy for your own house? Okay? To have that kind of control on it. Um, you know, we didn't have running water when the village was first born. But now, you know, we've got fire hydrants popped up everywhere. Um, lots of things that we can talk about there. But here are some images. This is my house uh, before I built an addition. This is my first little array that I put up in 2013, just to give you a reference point. This is on Walshells Road. We didn't know that. Compared to that, where my grid power comes from, I don't I, what's more as aesthetically pleasing or not. For that, this is a fracking site. So here's one. Um, this is not in Randall proper. Uh, I think this is up in Cleveland. Um, but this is one where they have purposely designed the framing and the panels to blend in with the roof as much as they can. But you can do that. So if you've got a black roof, they make black frames for, for solar and, and um, make it all look like it kind of blends in together. There's another example. These are integrated shingles into that one. That's hard. If you get far enough away, you'd never be able to pick that one. You've all probably seen this, 161. I thought this was great when I went in. You know, solar right there, right in front of us. Um, thought it was wonderful. Nothing, there's nothing that is not aesthetically pleasing about those solar panels. You may not like the building, the fact that that building even exists in that spot. Um, but there's, this does not detract from the site. Here's the block O that they made out of solar here at Ohio State. Um, so this is a rooftop, but they designed it that way. Just through that, that's kind of cool as well. Um, we often think solar's got to fit this traditional sort of. It's got to be on the roof. It's got to look like this. Um, so Ohio State put this one in near the stadium. So <clears throat> related to the cost again, I wanted to share this um, because I often get in these kinds of presentations. Um, I get people who uh, are really concerned about solar on a national scale, on a big scale, and, and things like wind as well, and that we'd be better off just sticking with gas or coal or natural gas. They're reliable, I'm sorry, or uh, um, nuclear. They're more reliable, they produce power all the time kind of thing, and, and they're more cost effective. And you can see that this, this is from 2022, uh, from the Energy Information Association, which is part of the uh, government. Um, Sure that is to me. Um, so you can see gas peaker plants. These are plants that when we have a really hot day in the summer, you got to turn on turn on that plant, the match load. Everybody's got their air conditioning on, and the grid's starting to run out of power. So they put on these peaker plants that only are used periodically, which is why they're the most expensive on this list. Solar thermal. I mean, let's be honest with you. Using solar to heat up water to create steam to then create electricity. Great idea, but it's really hard to get water that hot just from the sun. Um, so it's not, it's probably not the most viable way to create electricity. Um, then we go through and we get down here to things like solar PV and wind. And you can see that those are now the lowest price with subsidies. I want to be clear that we have that in. So companies that are building a solar plant right now are still able to take advantage of the 26% tax credit. So that's part of the reason why solar and wind are, are really competitive right now because they're still getting subsidized um, through those tax credits. However, natural gas, coal, nuclear are also getting subsidies. And we often forget that in the analysis that those subsidies happen all the time. Um, one of which is that there's something called a depletion tax credit. Who knows what that means? Well, it's like depreciation on a piece of equipment, right? Depreciation on a line. Correct. So I've got this mine full of coal, and every year I mine coal out of it. Now that mine's got less value, so I can write off the value of the coal that I already mined out, essentially. And so um, that, that's not an insignificant amount um, of money. So what does that, what does it all mean? It means that everything about solar renewables is viable. Solar's here to stay. It's not going to disappear. We're going to see more and more solar being developed, not only in Ohio but across the Midwest across the United States and across the globe. There are many that would argue that solar is our best bet for getting off fossil fuels. That that's probably where we're gonna head. 
I've heard some mumblings um, around something called micronuclear. Anyone in here been following anything about micronuclear? Bill Gates thing. I'm fascinated by it. What's that say? Bill Gates is building one in Idaho, I believe it is. Yep. So the, the idea the here reactor. is a small nuclear reactor, not in, not too indifferent from what you might find on a US aircraft carrier or nuclear submarine, where those are all powered by that. Not this massive like power plant, but honestly, something that you know, might fit into a closet um, that could power neighborhoods, you know, could, could power small towns like Orlando. Um, that's really fascinating to me. The idea is they're trying to build these in a way that they have they use such a small amount of radioactive material that even if there were an issue, it would not be a catastrophic issue. I don't know. We talk about this jokingly at Denison. We're like, yeah, that, that's going to go really well with this perspective of students and their parents. Like, yeah, you can live in this dorm right next to our little micronuclear plant. <laughs> um, so everyone's starting to jump onto, um, onto renewables. Even utility companies are starting to get into this game. They've been getting into it long before any of us have to realize. So the Denison Solar Array, the big solar array, we don't own that. That's American Electric Power Energy, which is a subsidiary of AEP that bought that array, built it, bought it, operated, operates it, and sells the power. So AEP Energy is also one of the entities behind a lot of the solar development that's occurring in Western Lincoln County. You guys are going to see some images of that here in just a second. There are many other utilities that are sort of thinking about how do we get into this game of wind and solar and other kinds of renewables because that's where everything's headed. They recognize investing in a new coal plant or a new, um, a new natural gas plant probably isn't a good long-term investment. And so they're starting to invest in this solar infrastructure, which also means that they have to invest in their, their transmission grids and being able to distribute power from this new solar field to wherever it needs to go. Um, are you guys interested in knowing what I paid for my array and what that finances, what those finances look like? Maybe go over it kind of briefly. So 2013. Oops, go back here. 2013. Um, 13 cents a kilowatt hour is what I was paying back then. Um, this is what, what my house used. This is before my son was born. Um, so I used a little bit more than that. And we got a hot tub, so it was a lot more than that. Um, but uh, I was averaging about $650 off of my electric bill. Um, and this is what the array, this is what I was quoted. It was $22,000 to install an array that was 2.75 kilowatts, 11 panels. Um, it would offset, um, Somewhere in the neighborhood of what is that 60% of my usage? So it's 30 kilowatt hours. I use 5,000, or I'm sorry, 2,000 kilowatt hours. I use 5,000. So 60%, and you can see how the numbers play out. Payback 13 and a half years. That was the turnkey solution. So that was uh, third son out of Athens, Ohio, came up, did an analysis, and said, This is what it would cost you. Then I met Richard Bennett. And uh, with Richard, he said, hey, I'm, I'm into the solar business. I'm putting an array on my house. Come to my house, help me install mine, and then I'll help you install yours. And so I was able to do mine as a DIY, and this is what it cost me. That was what I actually paid for the materials. Um, I had this incentive right here from the federal government. And so this was my total cost out of pocket, $47.60 versus $22,000. So payback 4.1 years. One thing I glossed over here, SREX. Anyone want to tell me what an SREX is? Swear <laughs> talk. Okay. SREC or REC, REC stands for Renewable Energy Credit. So an SREC is a renewable energy credit that is derived from solar power, which means a WREC would be one derived from wind power. And so every thousand kilowatt hours or Mega, one megawatt hour that you produce with a renewable energy source can be turned into a REC. Those RECs have value. You can trade them on the open market. So companies that want to source their energy from a green source, someone that wants to offset their electric use to be greener, can buy RECs. And if I produce it at my house and I sell it to you, Tom, I no longer can claim the green credit. You could drive by Welsh Hills Road my house and be like, I own that solar. That solar power is mine. And it would be if I sold you the Rex, it would be your power, um, even though it's on my house. 
Ohio, back in 2013, in Ohio, in Ohio law and the regulations, these wrecks were trading at $250 a wreck. So $750 a year, I that should have been, um, I produce three per year, 250 per wreck, that should say wreck, sorry about that. So $750 a year, I could get if I chose to sell my wrecks. I chose not to do that because I wanted to come to green credit. But a lot of people were choosing to sell them. A lot of solar investors were choosing to put in solar arrays and sell them. Unfortunately, the price of those wrecks is like $30. In fact, I looked this just last week, they were trading at $20. So the price of the wrecks have dropped because the state of Ohio removed the renewable energy standards. So this was the SB80, I forget what, what bill it was. Um, all of those got removed back in about 2014, I think, they just disappeared. And so there was no incentive anymore to have a market for these wrecks. So the price just went down. So now my array is covering at about a 10 and a half year payback. I still owe about $1,000 off that original array of my original investment. My array is, has a lifespan of 25 years plus. That's what it's warranted to. 25 years. I've had two pieces of my array break in the last year. Called the company, they sent me the replacement parts, no, no cost. So got it taken care of. That's the only thing I've ever had to do to my array was go up under the roof and replace something underneath two of my panels, which didn't take too long. So I calculate that over the lifespan of my system, that 25 years, I'm going to end up paying about five to six cents per kilowatt hour. For that power when you factor in what I paid for the array. And I'm currently paying 13 cents, 12 to 13 cents. So I look at that as a pretty good investment on my part. So this is the overhead of my house right here before the addition. Um, this is what I'll do on your homes if you ask me to come out. Um, I'll climb up on your roof and they'll say, This is where I want my array to go. And I'll take a few pictures of these different corners, the different points where the array might happen. And I'll use this fun little tool. Um, it's called a solar pathfinder. And what I'm doing is I'm finding out where the shading would occur, potential shading would occur from trees and any other structures. That's Richard, by the way. Uh, going across here are the months of the year. And then you've got the hours of the day going this way. What it's showing you is what time of the year and what time of day am I getting full sun? What does that look like? And then you, you put this into um, a computer model, factors in the weather for 43023, um, how many cloudy days we have on average, how many sunny days we have on average, how many, how many uh, significant snow events we have on average. And it spits out this crazy report um, that's going to show you things like how much, um, how much energy I'm producing, what kind of savings I would get per month based on the size of my array. What I'm really interested in is sort of how efficient is my site for solar? So this is saying compared to a perfect site, what would perfect be? Anybody? <coughs> I'm, I'm putting solar up. Where do I want? How do I want to orient this panel? What would be perfect? Uh, due south. What tilt? Sixty degrees. What did you say? Sixty. A little bit less than that. It's whatever the latitude is. Yeah. So forty degrees. Is that for 39.9 or something like that? So that would be ideal. Well, my roof has a 30 degree pitch, and my roof is located at 205 degrees, which is what is that 25 degrees less than true south. So I don't have perfect southern orientation. So what it says is my site is roughly 83% efficient compared to the perfect site. So that all gets factored in and it gets factored into my planet by my financial. And if anything, I'll get your question in a second. If anything, these kinds of programs in places like the Midwest, places like Randall, they underestimate because they count a deciduous tree as a block the entire year. Why in November, you hit November all the way through to about right now, those deciduous trees aren't blocking much sunlight. And so you actually get a little bit more production than what this model would say if you have trees in your site. Yes? How many do you need your solar? So I have almost all arrays now are set up so that you have online monitoring. It's part of the deal that you get. Um, and so 
I, my, the technology that I'm using is a company called Enphase. Um, and so what happens is each panel has a, a unit underneath it and it's spinning data to the, the great, you know, the great world wide web. And I can log into my account and I can see what my panels are producing in real time. And it will send me notifications um, if it's not communicating for some reason and or it hasn't produced over a period of time. And so there, there are hiccups all the time where something goes on, it'll be like a 15 minute pause. It doesn't notify me of those kinds of things. But I will get notifications that say, hey, panel 11 hasn't produced any power for 24 hours. And then it will run a diagnostic report and it will say, no, it's producing power. It just wasn't communicating. Um, yeah, and it corrects itself. Or it will say, yep, it's not producing power. And that's what happens. So two of my panels, the, um, the inverters underneath them failed. And so I, I called the company and said, hey, this panel hasn't been, hasn't been producing power for a couple of months now. And I, I feel like there's a real issue. They ran their own diagnostic and they said, yep, you're right, just going to be more. So for those of us who cannot replace yep. the part underneath that panel, what kind of expense is incurred? For sure. The so if you do a turnkey system where you hire, hire someone to put your array up, most of them will offer five years um, of something goes wrong with the actual infrastructure, they will replace that as part of the deal. Um, so they'll work with the company to get the replacement part and the labor involved. After five years, then typically what you'd have to do is you, you would have to call a company like that to say, I'm having an issue, I need someone to come out. And just like you would have someone fix a leaky pipe or fix a broken you know, light switch or something like that, it'd be the same kind of thing. Um, I can't tell you exactly what that costs, um, but I, I can tell you that the failure rate on these kinds of things is relatively low, especially when you look at my array's been up now for nine years, and I just had my first two failures in the last in the last year. Um, so I feel pretty good about you know what I'm doing. Um, when you get to these big, large arrays that go in, like like the Denison array, there are contracts of companies that will they'll do all of the operations and maintenance. Um, but like a company like Third Sun out of Athens, Ohio. Um, they would be a company that would warranty their work for a period of time. And then you can also buy into a, a long-term warranty plan. And, uh, I'd probably recommend to you not doing something like that because I'm not sure if you would get rid of any customers. I will also say this, though. Most of the electrical components involved with solar, which is why it's actually a really easy DIY project, are plug-and-play. It's here's a wire with a special fitting, here's a wire with a special fitting, they actually click together. It's done, um, and it's really not that hard. And then when you get into your actual um, electric panel, it's just a regular breaker, just like any breaker at their panel. So when things go wrong, most electricians now know how to fix those kinds of things. Um, and I often, so related to this, we get questions about, let's find a picture here so we can have a picture of what I'm chatting away. So that's us putting the, the uh, equipment in. Um, actually, this is a great picture to show. I often get questions about the roof. What happens when the roof needs to be replaced or starts to leak or something like that? So there's a lot of ways to think about that. Typically what a solar installer will do is they'll say, if you have like a shingled roof, 30 year you know, lifespan on that roof, if it's past that midway point, that's when you'd sort of be like, maybe I should just replace it now and put the solar in um, if you're past that midway point. If you're before the midway point, you're probably fine. The great thing about solar panels is they actually protect the roof underneath. So a 30-year roof with solar over it is probably going to last 50 years because it's getting no UV radiation. Well, it's getting very a very little bit of UV radiation. Um, and so it's not getting that, and it's not getting the weather in and those kinds of things that degrade an asphalt roof. A metal roof, you're good to go. That's the best roof to put solar on, to be honest with you. Very, very low risk of any kind of but these are, these are standoffs that you have to put in to support the railing. And these standoffs right here, you do, you do have to drill into the support structure of the, the uh, joist, or not joist, the rafter, sorry. You have to drill into the rafter. So there is a, there is a penetration, and that is a potential leak point, for sure. Um, but these are flashing boots, very similar to the flashing boots you have for a soil pipe that would go up um, through your roof. Um, and they're designed to really avoid any chance of water infiltration. Anything can fail, so never say never. 
Um, but I have not had any kind of uh, leaking issue. And I installed this roof. I installed this, and I am not a roofer. <laughs> and so far, it's doing pretty good. Uh, but you can see here, we had a team of, um, I don't know, four or five people that showed up to help lift panels up and put it up. The whole process, putting all of this infrastructure in, putting the panels up, clicking them together for 11 panels, took us about three and a half hours. And that's with a lot of time talking as we went through it, of uh, people asking questions, being like, okay, how did you do this? How did you measure that? Um, that's fast. Right? So that's that's the picture again. And then I'm gonna skip over that one. We built an addition and we put six more panels up. My wife and I put those up together, she and I, two hours. It's all to start to finish. No arguing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, maybe a little bit. Yeah, I don't want to downplay it because in my head, in preparation, I spent countless hours thinking about what how this was all going to go together, doing the measurements of like, okay, how far out. Where, where are my rafters essentially? What is that going to look like? I did all of that sort of on the ground on paper, you know, at 11 o'clock at night when I had time kind of thing. But the actual physical, getting everything up there, drilling in, putting all the infrastructure in, took almost no time at all. And the wiring, you can see there's a section right there, runs in through my attic, goes down through a wall in my house, and connects right into my electric panel. And that's, and that's how these things work. And so it's right into a, a, a break room in the house. Yeah. If you were building it, Sure. Best time to do it is when you're building it because you can then you can integrate all that infrastructure. You can run conduit in the house and not have to do it after. The, I did a lot of fishing wire and all of that. Um, thankfully, when I built this second one, I already had the wire on the first from the first one, so that that also made it a little bit faster to be able to do it that way. And then, what do you do with your Systems in the home, leave them as backup, or you you add them there, but you don't use them. So I, I have natural gas for heat. Yep, and so I, I have a I have a, like, some electrical appliances, just like you all have, and the lighting and everything like that. That's what this is offsetting. I have an electric water heater. So when I when I'm not getting power from the array, I'm just using power from the grid. Yep, but my the actual heat for my house is natural gas. How many of you know uh, Tracy Lang? Used to be Tracy Carafa. So Tracy Lang lives on the corner of Ranger Street and Welshells Road. Um, she has a couple of arrays um, going on. She built structures specifically for it. She has a Tesla power wall. She took um, her, they had natural gas for the heat, and they got an electric heat pump, um, air sourced heat pump. And her logic behind all of that is she's trying to slowly get her house to where she can just operate from her solar with having the, the battery system and the solar. And I think that's great. And that's a direction I'm going to go. So when, when my current gas furnace dies, I'm going to seriously look at an electric alternative. And I've got room to put more panels on because we build another addition. So <laughs> I've got room to add a few more panels. Um, I'm done building additions um, unless I need more solar. <laughs> um, so this is another key component, this concept of net metering. Um, the financial benefit of solar doesn't work unless net metering happens. So that, that's an important thing to remember. So net metering is this idea of your meter will spin backwards when you're producing more power than you're using, which is what allows you to uh, reduce your electric bill in the utility company. Um, and so when you're using more power, the meter spins forward, and it's this back and forth thing that goes on. And at the end of the month, the utility company reconciles the bill. And if you're someone like me, it'll say, this is how much money you push back, or this is how much energy you push back on the grid, this is how much energy you use, and here's what you now owe us. It's sort of the difference between those two if you balance that out. For some people who have bigger arrays than what I have, um, it sort of matched their load, their usage better. There are some months where they get a credit on their bill. Um, usually that happens in the, the winter months or the flex months when they're not using air conditioning. And then in the summertime, it's really hard to offset and, and whole house air conditioning unit is sold. Let's just be honest, it's really hard because those use a ton of electricity. Um, it's not impossible, but for the average home, you just don't have enough roof space to be able to offset all of that AC usage. Um, so at the end of 12 months, everything kind of gets all shook out. But the way that the energy flows is you produce the power on the, on the panels, 
It goes down to your inverter system, again, turning DC into AC, right? That goes to your electric panel, and then it either is going to feed right into your house, if you have a, a load in your house or you've got lights on or whatever it is, or it's going to get pushed back out through your meter, and then it goes into the distribution system. So I like to think on a really sunny day when I'm not using a whole lot of electricity and my solar is doing a great job, my neighbors on either side are actually getting those electrons. From my solar array. So they're, they're benefiting from that um, production. And of course, the utility company is charging them for the power that I create. Questions about net metering, because I went over that real fast. Yeah. Is that standard for anybody who doesn't have solar at the moment? I mean, is that is the energy company's meter capable of running back? They are all they are all bi-directional, yes. And if they're I should say they, they all are. AEP and their service territory has replaced all of them. I can't speak for the energy cooperative here in the county. I think they are because the energy cooperative is actually one of those entities that's proactive on this energy management. They've got programs where they actually control your electric water heater and then you on your co-op or they'll pay you to sort of put this device on your electric water heater so that they can turn your water heater off during the day and you're not there. To conserve power um, because power is more expensive during the day. Um, so I'm sure that there's are. But to get back to your question, if you have a um, natural gas generator, a whole house generator, you in theory could use that to back feed your grid and run your meter backwards. The problem is the price, the cost of running that generator is far more than the cost of the electricity they provide. So it wouldn't make sense to me. Um, good question. One other nuance with net metering. Um, it gets some people a little hot around the collar if they have an array installed, installed at their home and somebody sold them a bigger array than what they needed. In the state of Ohio, if you overproduce over a 12 month period, you produce more power than you use, the utility company has the option to treat you not as a net metering customer where you run the meter backwards and forwards, but as a utility. So they can say, you're no longer this regular residential person. You actually are a little power company. And because you've overproduced, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a situation where we will buy the power that you generated, but we're only going to buy it at the generation rate. It's the retail generation rate, which is like two or three cents a kilowatt hour. We're not going to let you spend your meter back. That's frustrating for a lot of people because there are solar companies that will come in and be like, yeah, we'll also we'll offset all this energy. You should be good to go. You won't pay another cent. And then they come to find out that they're overproducing every year. And, they're, and the utility company is saying, well, now that you're an overproducer, we can chart the rate structure is different. And instead of offsetting 13 cents a kilowatt hour, they're only offsetting three. That changes the whole thing. And so I know a couple of people here in Randall or a little bit wider net than that, that are in this situation. And they've solved that a couple of ways. One way is that they actually physically turn their array off for weeks at a time so that they can get it to all balance out. And or they say, well, fine, in the wintertime, I'm just going to get some plug-in electric heaters and I'm just going to use more electricity. And that stinks because that's a horrible way to solve that problem. <laughs> but but it is going, you know, that is a way to solve it. Um, and it's something that more progressive states than Ohio are working to address. Um, Ohio falls in the middle of the middle of the pack in terms of its uh, how it views solar and renewable energy in terms of the, the uh, Ohio law and regulation. So there are states that uh, Florida is one that's not so you know happy about solar where they don't even let you be a net meter customer. So you put solar on, all you can do is get that three cents a kilowatt. And that's because they're, they're trying to continue to support those, those local fossil fuel uh, generating power plants. So I don't want to get into the politics of that. Um, or if you want to, you can, but we'll do it over drinks. <laughs> um, large scale solar. So this is the last part of the, uh, the presentation is just talk about what the heck's going on. Big picture here in, uh, in Licking County in particular, but in Ohio in general. Um, so this is an example. This is not one from Ohio. I just pulled this off the internet of uh, just what these kind of things look like. I think you guys have all probably seen pictures of these kinds of 
of arrays. So this is just a big solar array. Um, here's from the Ohio Power Setting Board to give you guys an idea. The, the Power Setting Board has authority over any solar array that would be 50 megawatts or larger in size. So 50 megawatts is going to be something that's going to be at least 150 acres. For reference, Denison's is 2.3 megawatts. It sits on 10 acres. So we're talking about pretty significant arrays. So you can see all of these that are popping up. So uh, green, anything that's in green, there's one right there that's green. There's a couple down there that are green. These are operational. So they're already, they're already running. Um, anything that is uh, blue square is going to be something that's already in construction. So it's soon to be finished. Um, orange square are going to be ones that are in that pre-construction phase. There's one right here, the Union Ridge Solar. This is off Watkins Road um, near Pataskala. This is a 512-acre site that they're developing um, on a bunch of farmland right there. So that just got power setting board approval, I want to say, two months ago. Um, you've got the red dots. There's one right here. You know what this one is? This is the uh, Harvey Solar Project near Croton. 2,800 acres. I'm sorry. No, yeah, 2,800 acres is what that's taking up. That's massive. It's massive. It's no surprise to me. I'm not connecting these dots, but the dots are there to be connected. The Intel project gets announced a couple of weeks later. This is in the process of getting approved. Just saying. <laughs> so Intel has a renewable energy goal as a company. So I'm going to guess that somehow those are connected in some way, shape, or form. Um, and then the yellows are in the sort of the pre-approval where they're just now entering into the power setting board. And again, these are just for solar arrays that are 50 megawatts or larger. Anything under that doesn't fall into the purview of the Ohio Power Setting Board. Why is it listed Western Ohio? Yep, two reasons. So down here. It's actually, this is the sunnier part of Ohio, <laughs> down here. Um, you also get into this area, and you get into this area, and land is cheaper than it is in this area. And then you get over here, and the problem that you have over here, you start getting hillier, and that makes it much more challenging. So super flat up here, which makes it easier. You get hillier here, you also have a legacy of strip mining and other kinds of mining, which can create um, some apprehension about subsidence where like a mine collapses or the ground's not stable. And so you don't see as much development in these areas, large scale development in these areas. It's not impossible, but they have to be really careful about it. Um, in fact, for the Denison array, we actually looked at a different site on Denison's property originally. Um, I know it as the Denison Mountain, but behind the um, baseball fields, there's an area that's like, we just take all of our brush and random stuff and it's been going on for years and years and years. They did some geologic testing of that area, and they're like, this ground is so unstable, we would never put a solar array on it, uh, because it just wouldn't support those the, the pilings. That there. Um, so here's an example. This is Newark's solar array at the wastewater treatment plant. You guys know they had a big array there? Um, super awesome. This is a brownfield site. And so what they did here is this solar array actually sits on the ground. It doesn't. There's nothing about the solar array that penetrates the ground. Because it's a brownfield, so they didn't want to disturb the, the soil underneath. So these are this is just concrete castings to make sure the city doesn't blow it away. Uh, really awesome, uh, and this provides almost all of the power that the wastewater treatment plant needs. Uh, this is really really awesome. This right here, you can see this if you head up towards the yield mill. Is it still called that? Not the velvet left. Is that still? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the energy cooperative put this in a few years ago. Um, Relatively small, I think this is 250 kilowatts. Um, I like to show this slide not only because it's a local one, but here you've got grass underneath the panels. Here they chose to put gravel. I mean, it's a lot of gravel um, that they put down underneath those panels because they didn't want to have to mow or do anything like that. And then you've got Venison's array. This is a little bit of an impact for some of back. <laughs> um, so this is Venison's array in the bioreserve, and we planted this in pollinator habitat. First of its kind in Ohio, not in the nation, but not that you know visionary. Uh, we stole the idea from, from others, but um, the whole idea being we don't we didn't want it to be gravel, and just putting it in turf grass didn't make a whole lot of sense. You have to mow that turf grass, you know, 
with more frequency? What if we turned it into this pollinator habitat? Um, it would, I mean, this is located in the southeast corner of our bioreserve. Um, this would just give you an opportunity to um, increase the biodiversity in the area and do something do something different than a solar array like this to get away from the idea of this is an industrial site, this is a power plant, which it is, it's a power plant, um, and just make it a little bit nicer, and soften it up a little bit. And this is the trend now. So those big arrays that I was telling you about, the Hardy Solar and Union Ridge, um, their plans have included pollinator habitat as part of it. Um, whether they choose to put it underneath and in, in, in all the way around the panels, I don't know. At the very least, they're talking about putting it around the footprint of the entire array. And we do have over in this corner, you can't quite see it, uh, Jim Bidigary, local bee farmer, I like to call him a bee farmer, um, has established some honey beehives out there as well, which is really cool. So again, this is our 10 acre site. Um, really, really cool. I COVID hit, but right before COVID, I had plans to put in a bird observation deck out there. It would be high enough up that you'd be able to see the whole array, but that's not why I wanted to put it up. There are tons of birds. Has anyone been out here? Like during the morning, the birds are all over the place. Um, really, really cool. So going back to these big arrays. So this is the one that is the Union Ridge. So there's Watkins Road. And at some point, um, I'm trying to think about, get my bearings here. Um, what is it? Uh, 16 is probably up here somewhere. Um, but this just gives you an idea of the footprint of this array. So this is 512 acres total. And you can see that it's broken into pieces. There's a piece down here as well. So that just gives you some perspective of how big this is. Is and then in construction now? Is that, oh, this one's in construction now. Yep. Uh, the high school is down... There's a track at the top. Yeah, is that a track down here? Okay. I don't know if that's a track or not or how. I think it is down a little further down. Here. This is the one, I don't have the same, you know, I don't have the parcels they have on this one. I just stole it from the uh, Harvey site. Um, but this is the Harvey array that they're proposing. This is the one that will have 28 total, 2,800 total acres of coverage. Uh, so here's here's Hartford, here's Centerburg. Um, gives you an idea of this is one mile distance here. I mean, this, this is big, guys. This is really big. This is the this is the size that actually I'm I'm a solar advocate. This is the one that I'm like I don't know I don't know well, well that's a lot it's a lot of land. <laughs> um, but I will say this I did I spoke at a, a dinner that they were hosting for um, the farmers and, and people that were leasing their land for this and overwhelmingly all of them were were actually really excited by this um, because the revenue that they're going to get from this is better than what they would get from farming it traditional row crops. And so for many of them, they sort of felt like um, this was a way to keep keep the family farm in the family. Um, the companies bill these as their 30 year leases. Um, and so they say, and this is true of even the Denison contract, ours is a 25 year one, where the company says at the end of 25 years, at the end of 30 years, you don't want this anymore, we pull it out and return it back to the works. That's not going to happen. Once you put in this infrastructure, somebody else at the end of 30 years is going to come so the infrastructure is already there. We'll give you this much to allow us to put the upgrade to do whatever. This is always going to be solar. Never say never, but and this is always going to be solar. And I don't like it when people talk about that and use that as a reason, like, well, we can turn it back into the farm at any point, you know, after that 30 year period. The reality of it is that's probably not going to be the case unless 30 years from now, being a traditional road crop farmer <laughs> is where all the money's at. And then people will make that decision. They said I can make more money farming than I can farming sun. Yeah. Do you think that the technology would evolve to make the panels smaller to maybe give back some of the land? Because maybe farming is a great, you know, yep. career and yep. stuff. Um, yes, the technology will evolve. What I imagine what will happen is in a site like this, it'll go in 10 or 15 years from now, the technology will have evolved so much so that they'll say, great, we're going to replace all the panels. Now we can double the output of this around. I think that's more plausible um, to have happen. Now, in Texas and other places, they're doing something even, I don't want to say more interesting, but certainly different than this idea of pollinator habitat, um, where they're putting in solar arrays and they're actually putting them in where you have sheep farms. And so the sheep can graze around the solar array 
they won't hurt the array at all. The sheep, uh, by nature, are not they're not like goats. They don't like to chew anything, and they're not big like cattle. Cattle will cattle like to scratch and like, rub into things and they'll break things. The sheep are very docile around these kinds of structures. That's a great dual use, um, and we're starting to see more of that being proposed. Of how can I use this site not only for solar but also for some other benefit? There are others that have found ways to still do some type of farming in between the rows. Um, so that's another, if you have a low row crop like soybean or something like that, and you design the, the equipment the right way, you can still harvest that without damaging the animals. Um, so these are all things that are evolving. So again, I got about six more minutes, but I'm going to keep going. You guys can walk up. We're almost done. Um, so this is an example of, um, this is from the, Shoot, where is this? This is down in Highland County. Is that close to Cincinnati? I don't, I don't remember. It's either Highland or Brown County. Um, I should remember. I took the picture today. I took it off the internet today. So this is an existing array um, down in southeastern, southwestern Ohio. Um, again, I think what this does is helps give you that perspective. So we saw the images before, like on a map, what does this all look like? You can see farms around here. The array kind of cuts in that way, this and here. At the time, well, this is still currently the largest um, array. In Ohio, um, and it is a thousand acres total. So again, that Harvey Ridge or that Harvey one is only three times this size. That's good. Um, so I like to look at it this way. So the, the title of this presentation is "Is Solar Right for Ohio?" I like to look at this and sort of is Ohio right for solar? Um, we talked about some of the challenges in terms of the, the legal structure, the fee structure associated with utilities and net metering and all of that. But there are other probably more prescient challenges like local zoning. This is a big issue, not just for Granville, but for lots of communities of whether or not you have um, rules in place to do things like whether it's residential or business or large scale solar, whether you have the right rules in place to allow for this kind of development, whether you know if your community wants to do it, um, or wants to make it okay for people to do, have you removed some of the the barriers and roadblocks, or the reverse of that. If your community is apprehensive about solar, have you put in the right kinds of zoning to make sure it only goes into places where your community wants? I'm going to be somewhat agnostic on that because I, I, I'm I, pretty much a believer that there, there are right places for solar and there are wrong places for solar. Um, and every community has to deal with this. Um, I'm also a little bit gun shy because I think most of you know we have that challenge. Uh, Dennis and Vicky, we put in our solar array. We had a two year legal challenge on the zoning. Um, it was not a comfortable thing to have happen. These are my neighbors. They, they literally were people that lived across the street from me. Um, at the end of the day, those things worked themselves out. Um, most of those neighbors, while they probably wouldn't publicly say I'm totally fine with this, have since said it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know, I actually enjoyed watching it take place. Um, you're right, I actually can't see it from my house. Um, but th this was a really hard time for me. Um, but it made it through that zoning. Um, and then the township at the time, because the array that's by our recycling barn, as you head out on 661, that array is actually in the township. And the township took a different approach to the whole zoning issue and had hearings uh, for people to come and weigh in. And, and I was the only one that showed up. Um, so we, I worked with the township to draft some, some rules around solar, both small scale and large scale. Um, those rules probably need to be revisited because even in five or six years' time, I think the, the landscape's changed. When we see 2,800 acre arrays going in, you know, is that something Brandville would be comfortable with if we took a big farm, you know, just north of town right across from you guys or something like that? You know, I don't know. And, uh, and it's better to have a plan in place and it's better to think about these things as a community um, to try to address them. Uh, than it is after the fact getting into legal battles and having neighbors upset with each other. HOAs, right? Who was my HOA person? I was just talking, was that you talking about your condo association? Yeah. So, um, condo association, HOAs, um, this is no doubt in my mind the biggest obstacle for a lot of people to do solar. Uh, those HOAs by nature have an incredible amount of, of power. They're, they're sort of, you know, vested in them. They, they can. Thumb up, thumb down on just about anything you want to do with your house. If it doesn't fit perfectly within those HOA rules, you can get fined. They can say it can't happen. Um, and this is where I think a lot of growth needs to happen, a lot of education needs to happen um, about what solar is, what it isn't, and getting back to that aesthetic point. Because that's really what it's about. 
HOA is going to maintain certain aesthetic that way to help men who are looking into it. And um, if solar doesn't quite fit into it, you're not going to get anywhere with that. Um, there are lots of ways to work around this. There's technology evolving. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of some technology that can get around it um, in just a second. Then you've got things like the state and local government control. Uh, the state just passed some rules um, recently that gives township trustees authority over these big arrays that are the 50 acre, or, sorry, uh, 50 megawatt, 300 acre, 1,000 acre, 3,000 acre um, arrays. Now township um, trustees can get involved in thumb up or thumb down with those. I don't know whether that's good or bad. It's different. It used to be that the power setting board would just come in and it didn't matter what the local residents wanted or didn't want, the power setting board could say this can happen or can't happen. I'm not sure I like that either. Um, but this is all where, hey, let's be proactive about this. Let's let's talk as a community. Let's talk as a county. Let's talk as a state and kind of figure out where do we want this to go? What are the right places? What are the wrong places? Um, and then we've already mentioned the whole the utility piece there, uh, event metering and all of that. Utilities are just not wanting to, they don't want you to have power on your solar on your homes. <laughs> Straightforward, that's that's pretty much what it is. Um, because that's your your customer, they don't want to lose that customer. Now they're all about you getting an EV. And that's AP wants you all to have EVs. Um, they were running a great incentive not too long ago where they were they give you like five thousand extra dollars if you got a Nissan Leaf. So you got like the federal credit for a Nissan Leaf, but they were gonna give you an additional five thousand dollars because they want you to use that power. Um, utility companies will get on board, and, and the reason that they're gonna get on board, this is me, this is my opinion. I'll just throw that out there. Um, the reason they're going to get on board is that technology is evolving so quickly on solar, battery systems, cars being able to power your, house, your homes, that you're going to start to see people say, I don't actually need the utility. And as soon as that starts happening, the utility, in mass, the utility company is going to have to do something. And what I think they're going to end up doing is they're probably going to want to control who has solar on the roof. In other words, they would come to you or you or you, and they would say, Hey, we're going to come put a solar array up here, and it's going to be built into your building structure. You're going to have this array, this is great. And, and so, people are going to jump on it because there are a lot of people that actually want that solar, especially if the utility can, company can devise a way to say, and if the grid does go down, you're still going to be able to get some amount of backup power. Um, so, the future of solar this is where I think everything's going. This is uh, some research being done, and this is in France. Actually, this one's in China. But uh, France, China, Sweden, Norway are all sort of getting into this idea of a solar roadway. Um, if you embed the panels in all the roads and use that, that's a great idea because that's that is real estate that you don't use for anything else. So putting solar and all of that, um, it's actually amazing. There have been tons of studies that because people will say, well, there's all these cars going up, but shading all the time. Even in rush hour traffic, they've done studies of like how much space in a road is actually open. It's like 65 or 70 percent of the space in rush hour traffic in the road is unhealthy. It's crazy. So there's a lot of potential there if you can get get it pulled up. Um, solar uh, parking canopies. These are already sort of ubiquitous in a lot of places. Desert Southwest, they're everywhere. Um, this is what I'd like to see Denison do. Um, this is I, this is the next big opportunity for Denison, in my opinion. Um, this is that on a smaller scale. So this is a little solar canopy with an electric charging kind of connected to it. Um, but this is all rooted in this concept of smart grid. Talk to anybody in the utility industry. Um, Mark, I think it's Mark Redder is the, is the chair of AEP. Um, he lives here in Randall. Um, you talk to any of these people, and they will tell you that if they had the, the US electric grid to redo, they would never design it the way it is designed now where it's like a massive power plants and we're trying to connect them all with these massive distribution lines. Um, they would never do it that way. It would be decentralized. So you have smaller power plants powering a neighborhood or a town or a small region, and they would all be interconnected. So if one goes down, the, other, the neighboring one can provide power. Um, so here's the, here's my workaround on HOAs. There's a company called SolarSkin which is devise a product and there are others now that are jumping on it, where these are the solar panels right here. And this is the regular roof. And they've created the solar skin that you can put over the panels to mimic the roof. Now it's pretty obvious, you can see the lines there. But as you start getting further away, if you had a black roof, 
black shingles, you put a solar skin on that looked like shingles, it'd be very hard to tell. Um, and they, you lose about 3% in efficiency because of the little bit of shading that that causes. But this is one way that they're trying to, um, to develop to get around the concern from HOAs and condo associations about the aesthetics. Is to say, we can make this blend in really, really well. Um, this is using the side of buildings. Um, so integrating solar into the walls, uh, so vertical solar. Um, this is in Singapore. So these are floating solar arrays. I, I think this is somewhat visionary. Um, there is a 75% of our globe is covered by water. Uh, and not all of those places could have an array, but there are lots of places you can think of where you could, you could put an array like that. I mean, it's literally that high off the water, so it's not blocking a, a view like a windmill would, um, you know, off in the distance. There's potential there uh, to do that in some places. These are sh uh, shingles integrated with solar. So they look very similar. I know the picture quality is not great, the lights are on, but these are shingles that, uh, where, where the shingle itself is the solar panel. And so it really does look like, you know, a metal roof or, or it looks like a, um, a slate roof or something like that. And so you can integrate it in there. This is another way to get around some of these HOA concerns is that it really just looks like whatever roof it is. Five minutes. I can entertain a few questions for those that want to stick around for questions. So, oh, go ahead. You talk. Uh, answering one of the questions about improvements in efficiency. What is the efficiency now of a solar panel system? Not just the panel, I guess, but the inverter and all the other stuff. Sure, I and mean, that, that, that can get measured in so many different ways. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you the answer that, the way that you want it. So a silicon-based solar panel, um, silicon is like the most common um, panel. When I first put my array in, they were in the 17 to 18 percent efficiency. They're now in probably the 22 or 23 percent efficiency. And the scientific, um, what do they call it? There's a term for it, like the the limit. That's the farthest you can get. Right. Is about 29%. But you just can't get more efficiency out of it. Now, what is that 29% of what? That's the part I'm not off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but in any case, it was about 50%. You can go another 50% on a panel. Correct. Side, which compared to where you're yeah. Yep. And it's then theoretical. Theoretical. Thank you. It's the theoretical max. Yeah. And then you've got things like uh, cadmium telluride panels, which is what first solar. You've heard of first solar, they have a big plant in Toledo. Um, one of the largest, they are the largest US based solar panel manufacturer. They're using cadmium telluride. Um, those panels are in the neighborhood of 12 or 13 percent efficiency, so they're not as good at, on the efficiency side of things. They're using a more toxic material, but they don't, their panels don't require frames. So, traditional silicon based has an aluminum frame that's a lot of material that goes into that. These other ones, um, however, they're able to design it, don't have. So they're able to produce those actually cheaper, even though they're using a harder to source material than silicon. Uh, but they do lose a little bit on the, on the efficiency side of things. To maybe put this in a better perspective, um, the panels that I have in my house, so a typical solar panel is 40 inches by 66 inches, 65 inches in size. That would be a 60, um, a 60 cell panel, so something like this. The ones that I have on my rooftop are, are rated at 250 watts which means when they were installed, max power, perfectly sunny day, just the right temperature, in theory, they could produce 250 watts an hour. That same size panel now, you can get it at 320 watt. So that's the climb in efficiency. Right, yep. and that, that's pretty amazing. Um, in fact, they're, they're already starting to develop and put out the ones that are 350 watts. Um, I don't know if they're doing that on the uh, residential side, but on the commercial side. So we're seeing that again, they're getting close to that, that max efficiency. Um, if they can get out of silicon. So now there's a lot of research going on about um, so you've got cadmium telluride. There are people trying to find other materials um, to be able to capture um, solar. There's research even going into algae and how you can use algae as a as a mechanism to capture that energy and pull it back out. It's really fascinating. Um, uh, quick question, what's the cost of Electricity for, for Denison from their existing solar panel. Sure. Is it the same price or is it more or less? Or? We pay nine cents per kilowatt hour for our for 
grid power is we're paying, um, I think, 9.8 for the solar right now. We have a 2% escalator uh, for the solar, um, annual escalator, and grid power, unfortunately, grid power is kind of stagnated for us, um, for everybody, I think, over the last three years. You may not think so when you look at your bill, but if you actually look at what you pay for transmission, distribution, and generation, it's been hovering around that 12 or 13 cents pretty consistently. Uh, and Denison was hoping that that, but we didn't want it to go up, but that would make the solar look more attractive. Yeah. And uh, there's been some interesting feedback on the base um, farm that was proposed, as well as the feedback that we got during the development as an installation. Can you kind of like talk some lessons learned about how to introduce the concept of larger solar to communities in a way that creates an effective dialogue? <laughs> I don't know, like that's a good question, but it's. Um, it's interesting that the negative responses that come out and sure. you know when that notice one and so forth. Yep. Well let me let me make this into a real world example attention. I'll use the fact that you're on the school board. Yeah. So the best way I think lessons learned mm -hmm. is if Granville were interested in putting solar on some of the land of the, the GIS mm -hmm. at the intermediate mm -hmm. school, the best thing that would happen is before that conversation gets any further than uh, I think we're kind of interested in this. Uh, calling a meeting of all the neighbors mm -hmm. and starting there and saying, here's, here's what we, this is what we'd like to do. And this is why we want to do it. Mm -hmm. And before we hire anybody to throw any of this out, mm -hmm. we want to know what you think. We want to involve you in that process right from the start. Yeah. We may still do it based on your feedback, yeah. but we want to know what are the things that most concern you because earlier in the process, you have more ability to, to modify and to change that. So that would be like one thing for sure. As that we actually went through that process about 10 years ago, and because we were thinking about all kinds of energy, and we were thinking about solar panels with Granville Intermediate School. And so, you know, we got a group of community members together and said, What do you think? And they said, No way, never. It's going to be the worst thing. And I hate the fact that the bells are ringing all the time, and there's kids screaming, and we didn't want the yeah. school here to begin with because it's free farmland. And so, no, you shouldn't be solar panels. Yep. <laughs> right? And it was just an interesting process. It was actually student led, yep. right? And so, you know, at that time, we Financial incentive to do it or not do it, but that was also 10 years ago. Sure. And that community has really benefited from a land lab and from the way it's kind of settled into it. But you know, at the time, they had just seen a farmland in terms of real school on the ground. Right? Sure. Like yeah. that was amazing, which is what I want to say. Which, which totally. But I think trying to also address things like um, are you, if you're concerned about the, the visual piece of it, Mm -hmm. you know, well, we, we might be able to address that by yeah. putting in uh, yeah. tree barriers yeah. or putting in pollinator habitat, or even some people will, will mound up in front of the array to block that direct view kind yeah. of thing. All yeah. of those things can be on the table in those kinds of discussions. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the potential negative to something, well, solar for the schools would, would actually provide a financial benefit. Yes, yeah. so for yeah. sure. But you think about other places in Granville um, or in the area, in the county, there is significant financial benefit. So the, the Harvey project is going to put um, millions of dollars into the Northwood School District. There's a school district that needs money. Uh, and they're already working with the Croton Fire Department. So they're getting, they're getting two fire trucks. Will 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 when yeah. this goes in. And there's a uh, fee and lieu of payment. So in the state of Ohio, um, instead of paying like property taxes um, on these large solar developments, you pay a, you pay a fee. Um, instead of paying those, those uh, taxes, and those fees go into the local government, you know, go into the local school district and so forth. The whole Harvey project is supposed to be pumping in, I'll say it's on their website, um, over the course of the next 10 years or something like that, four or five million dollars. Yeah. Uh, utility, uh, property taxes and taxes due to the utility are sort of best for school districts in terms of the way they go and the rates that they have in the baseline and energy. So it's yeah. really great for the schools. Yeah. So there's, there's just, there, there can be some financial benefit. The other thing, I mean, just generally speaking about, there's just a lot of apprehension around solar. And what I found to be really fascinating about the Harvey solar project in particular is that there, there's an equal, equally sized group of neighbors who are just angry that this array is going in. So you've got the ones that are like, I'm getting a financial benefit, like this can help me out. And then you get the ones that are really, really angry about it. And still today, some of the things that get lobbed out there that are anti-solar are not rooted in any fact. 
um, you know, things like, well, this is going to cause planes to crash flying into Port Columbus Airport. That, that's just not the case. You know, you've got large solar arrays at the point, but Denver Airport has solar arrays all over the place. Um, you actually have to get approval from the FAA when you put in a large solar array to make sure that it's not in a, you know, flight plane or flight way or that it's not positioned in such a way that it even could potentially cause that. Um, but you, you still get people throwing that kind of stuff out, or it's going to be really loud, or you know, I mean, there's just things that go all over the place, um, or there's going to be this, there's going to be a massive. What about massive fires and things like that? Sure, sure, you could get it. You could get an electrical fire from one of these places that could that could then turn into a brush fire. But solar panels themselves don't burn. There's there's nothing you know flammable about the actual solar panels themselves or the metal filings in there. Um, but people keep throwing those kinds of things out. And that's unfortunate because what happens is it doesn't allow you to get to the real dialogue. And we see this everywhere in society. So now you're gonna make me go for it. I'm not. <laughs> I know you guys gotta cut me off. You see this happen everywhere in society where instead of actually talking about the issue right in front of us, we bring in all this extra stuff. And then we can't actually talk about the issue in front of us. So, all right, you guys, I don't know why you wanna call it. Yeah, you can see me out there. <laughs> We're gonna see him walking around. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. I hope that's all about it was interesting and informative and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. This is great. I love doing this. <laughs>